All right, man. Yeah, it's been so long since we talked to each other. Um, well, I think you mentioned that you're, uh, you guys are in Vegas. I, when we were in Vegas, we were all in Vegas together one time. I can't. We're a couple yeah, times, one right? time. Yeah, one time we uh, we were doing a Jade of Thunder. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I was, uh, I don't know, I was, I was still like infatuated with Lindsay, so I wanted to bring her out wherever I could. So <laughs> I, would, uh, you know, she she came out because we had a few weeks off. I'm still infatuated yeah. with. Her, don't get her wrong. But <laughs> yeah, I, no, know, that's yeah, when, it's right. we had a, we had a long weekend, so I was like, "Hey, come out to Vegas," you know, and uh, I thought it was a good time. Yeah, yeah, man. We, I think we were we were up late that night. I remember getting that drunk per se, but I mean, we just were like up and going like all night. It seemed like yeah, every, everything else was good. That we got tattoos at Vince Neil Inc. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? Of course, we overpaid for tattoos because it's like shop minimum was like I don't know 150 bucks, and we got. The initials tattooed on each other, so three letters on each of us on our wrist, and Jeez. that was like a four hundred dollar date. Oh my you know, god! Should have been about twenty dollars at your local store. Hey babe, it's the beginning of forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Focus on what's important, man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, man. Um, so let's. So speaking of that, let's let's give a. Why don't you, if you don't mind, give a quick synopsis of. You know, your first duty assignment all the way to retirement and then, you know, just kind of take us through that whole career and then we'll back up and um, hit on some high points. All right. So as every as every well, I think you got to start with why even join the military. Yeah. And the reason for that was I got in a little bit of trouble and <laughs> I got picked up from my parents, uh, picked me up from jail, from court uh, Monday morning after I saw the judge and took me straight to the recruiting station and in Columbus, Georgia, they were all like in the same station. Yeah. You know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines right there. And they took the earrings out and said, Hey, I don't care what service you're joining, but you're not getting, you're not leaving here till you join something. So I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. so joined the Air Force. And I was like, well, if I got to do something for four years, I might as well live the good life. And um, I think my first job, I was supposed to be a crew chief on F-15 was my guaranteed job. Yeah. And then, you know, you get into basic and the basics like, I can't remember this dude's name, Gardner or something like that. Yeah, yeah, Warren Gardner probably. Yeah, yeah, I think that's who it was. Yeah, he come around. And I was like, you know, just dude was a salesman. You know that he was. You know, you're gonna be jumping out of airplanes and banging strippers and and <laughs> shooting guns and tanks. And I'm like, that sounds fun. So I go try out and basically like everybody and get get picked up. So I was like, well, if I got to do four years, might as well do something fun. So let me go do this tag P thing and. Uh, so then first duty station was Fort Hood and I was a horrible airman <laughs> at Fort Hood. I really right. was. I um I have to thank J C Campbell, you know Jerry Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know more, JC, yeah. yeah, I have to thank him for literally keeping me in the service because uh I was he was my supervisor for eight years in a row at three Whoa. different duty locations. Oh really? So, yeah, so so he was there at Fort Hood, then we went to Baumholder, Germany. And then I went to Fort Riley, and then uh, then I that's when I split and went down to the 17th. Uh -huh. And then uh, I retired out of the. Then I went to the 720th after, you know, you can only do the the 17th for so long before, um, before I was getting the ultimatum. And yeah. so, <laughs> um, so then I went and uh, down at Herbert Field, 720th, and I retired out of the 24. So, okay, back in 2017. So that's kind of the overview of, of the career. Yeah, JC, I I was in uh JC was in Korea when I was over there. So we got crazy a bunch of times. I think I I want to say that uh I went with him and a bunch of other dudes to, to Japan, I want to say. I he I'll have to have him on and uh he can just clarify what I'm thinking about. But yeah, we had, I had a blast with that dude. He's he's awesome. Awesome guy. So you, your first assignment uh Hood. So wait, so you so you PCS from Hood to Germany. Did he go at the same time or was he just there? Or did he come later, or how? Yeah, how did that I work think it's within. Oh man, I think it was within like a few months of each other. Yeah, you know that we because we ended up going to Riley about the same time too. And uh, <laughs> well, yeah, because it's like a two-year that... tour. So if you, I guess if you guys well, we did four years. Oh, you did four years. Oh no, kidding. Yeah, kid. four years. Yeah. Dang, um, I remember him. Well, that, that's another story too. But I remember him. He was deployed to like Kuwait or something. You know, we weren't really doing anything back in 97. Right, right. 
he gets a phone call. Richie got arrested. I'm like, oh, shit. So <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. I was one of those airmen that was – I was a supervisor's nightmare. Yeah. And it was all – it was never really, like, that bad. But – Yeah. But that one got blown out of proportion. And, well, see, that's the thing about you, man. It's like – you when people hear those kind of things, they think the worst, but it's like you, you're like the most like low key laid back, you know, badass dude. I know, you know, like nothing, it, it, you, no matter what kind of situation we're in, it's always, this is how you are all the time. So like I, when I hear, when I hear you say stuff like you got arrested or you got in trouble, I'm like, it had to be something. It couldn't be that bad. You know what I mean? It couldn't be like you were getting crazy or well, whatever. Right? Just to add a little context to this. When I say it wasn't that bad, I had this little, uh, I had this little car with hydraulics on it and it was about, it was a bouncy car. Right. So when I, I was pulling out of the strip club one night and my brake light, because it was so bouncy, I had like a loose connection. So my tail light was out. So obviously yeah. the cop pulls me over one for the tail light being out, but as a reason to um, pull me over, cause I just pulled out of the strip club. And um, so he probably thought you were drinking or whatever. Pulls me over. Yeah. I probably thought I was drinking. Right. So pulls me over yeah. and, um, uh, Turns out I had gotten a speeding ticket while I was on leave when I first joined the mo- like on the break home between like basic training and or tech school and I went on leave got a speeding ticket and didn't pay my speeding ticket and I didn't realize I was young back then I didn't realize that that was get your suspended license so yeah oh, boop, got a suspended license well he's like I got to take you to jail I'm like oh shit well when I get picked up the next day from the first sergeant. And they take me straight to the unit, giving me the, the rundown, drug test me, like all kinds of stuff. And I'll, I'll save you all the details, but the short story of it is the police put my name on the bottom of somebody else's police report. So they had pulled a guy over, had like a pound of marijuana and was a DUI. And oh that's, what, that's, what, that's what my name got attached to. So... <laughs> I get to the unit. Oh that's what's going to happen. And it was really just a suspended license that I paid the ticket. And I was, I was good, but yeah, um, like they were ready to kick me out. Like they were running through the, and that's what JC but, got the phone call that I was arrested with a pound of weed. And, and I was a drug dealer around Fort Hood. Like the stories just got blown out of proportion, yeah. you know? So all because the cop, well, he just, he just jotted your name down on that other guy's thing. Yeah. Yeah, he had filled out the, when he was turning his paperwork at the end of the night. He had filled it out on the wrong port. And uh, I, I will say, they made right after about two weeks. They called back to the to the squadron, and um, they said, "Hey, our bad. We messed this up." You know, <laughs> it's the least case. they could do. Jesus. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, between that and other things, I, I couldn't wait to to get out of Fort Hood. So I was I was like, "Let me go to Germany, volunteer. How? What's the quickest way to get out of Fort Hood?" And they're like, "Volunteer to go yeah. overseas." So I signed up and like within a week I had orders. That was and you good. said you were at a bomb holder? Yeah. So I went to bomb holder. Um, I don't remember what unit we supported there. It was, it was armor division. You know, um, I didn't really do anything significant in, in Germany as far as the career goes yeah. outside of, outside of, we did a little Kosovo Albania fight. Oh, and, cool. but there really wasn't, you know, we had like the initial invasion and then, just rotations down to Camp Bond still in Kosovo. And that wasn't yeah. anything significant really that um, that came of that. I think the most it's significant thing actually was stuff. while I was deployed, I had an ALO who liked me and he got me sent on a TDY back to Aviano to get a F-16 ride. So from nice. a deployment, I got a, yeah. So I got a F-16 ride for in a week TDY to Aviano. <laughs> that's awesome. Like, that's pretty good. In Germany too, I did uh, you know, that's kind of transitioned, about the first year or two, I was kind of still a recovering airman, you know, and <laughs> right. I almost got put out there too. And uh, then I kind of changed, like turn, I made the turn to, to be a, yeah. get my trip together. And so I ended up going to, I went to pre-ranger over there in Swineford and passed and got a recommendation to go to school. And then there was, there was weird things over there. Like you had to have six months retainability after you graduated school before they would send you. Like there was all yeah. kinds of, because it was overseas. So, but that made me get the direction. Like, man, I, I really want to go to the Rangers. And so then I came PCS went to uh, Fort Riley. Right. Yeah, and I showed yeah. up at Riley. I don't know. I think like October of 98, maybe 
No, October of 02, I think is about when I got to Riley, somewhere around that time frame. Okay. And what was significant with, with JC is we were out at NTC doing a rotation in like, I don't know, January of 03. And that's when, you know, the flag, the balloon's going up. We're going to war, right? Yeah. For, oh, yeah. Well, everybody that was in the back, they all picked, they got the first pick of the units they were going to go to support. And so they're like, oh, we're going to 82nd, we're doing this, and we're like... Oh, the we guys that were not at NTC, you're talking about. Yeah, the guys that were not at NTC, they were sitting back oh. in the 10th, like, when the orders come down, they picked which, like, their battalions were like, oh, we're going to go support these guys, and we're going to be with the 82nd, we're going to do this, and we're going to jump in and do all this stuff. And it was it was crazy. And me and JC were like, it was me, JC, Timmy Officer, and, and Nate Wright, or not, Nate Rice, got, uh, yep. we got, like, just a shit. They're like, we're bringing up the rear of the gear, you know? Oh, man. Um, and it was, we were mad, but we're like, all right. So we're packing out. And it was just so funny because our battalion got sliced from who we were supposed to support. And they needed an extra tank battalion to roll with third ID up to the initial invasion. And so yeah. everybody who picked their assignments got nothing, got very little action. <laughs> and And we did see a lot. So that was a good it's kind of nice karma. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, and they were all kind of forgetting about you, and then lo and behold, you get up there in the front. Yeah, so tell me about that. Like you were, we were talking about that the other day. You said that like you and Timmy and JC were getting into it over there. Yeah, the, which uh, real quick, I've always said I said this on this podcast before, but like the the armor guys that went to Iraq. I mean, you you guys really kind of set the stage. You really facilitated kind of movement of U.S. forces around there. Like, if it wouldn't have been for you guys like you, you know, nobody else would have probably been doing anything over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and I won't, you know, I was I was behind, like, uh, Shropshire and Crosby, you know, Travis Crosby. Like, we were, yep, yep. They, were the, they were the tip that, that was going from the third idea, and we were right behind them. I remember ripping out Shropshire right after he got in some big fight on, at like, a bridge. Um, yeah, you got a silver star but, for that. Crosby right. got a silver star also. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I yeah. ripped him out. So I, so I won't act like we were the first guys through the water. You know, yeah. It was you know when we got over there to Kuwait, the uh, our stuff was stuck on the boat, so we didn't have our one one three. We didn't have our Humvee with our pal. We had none of our gear. We had to go borrow stuff. I remember like oh in the week before we crossed the border, um, we got a hold of one one three, got a jerk to a six pilot. We installed it ourselves into the 113 and got everything everything going on literally borrowed equipment we had one 117 go or one 117 fox that we used and everything else was like hf comms through a 104 or, or back to the top yeah so you know but it, it worked for us so the way it happens we would kind of take turns like jc was the battalion NCIC, and then uh he would you know some days he'd be running the talk and then and i was uh I think I was senior airman, and then uh, Nate and Timmy were both uh, A1Cs. Okay. And so we would just rotate who's, who's Romad was going to be who as, as we go out and do things. And we got to do a bunch of interesting things. I mean, aside from the fighting, like I was telling you that uh, we found an F-16 canopy over there. Right. That was from one that shot down from the uh, from first Gulf War and had some captain's name on it. We strapped it to the back of the water buffalo and towed it around with our 113. And got it up to the ASOC, and and it was going to get sent back to that guy. That was kind did of funny. Did he ever? Um, uh, did he ever uh, get the? Did he ever receive it? Did he ever get it? I don't know that. Uh, JC might know that if you have him on, because uh, it was one of those things where they shouldn't shift it off. And um, other things that were probably notable, we had. Uh, remember when Geraldo was over there and got in trouble for briefing? Like <laughs> we had our, we got our pictures. We had just taken pictures with Gerardo. He was briefing our rock drill on TV, <laughs> right when he got kicked out of country. So, Did he uh, get kicked out because uh, he was giving away too much? Like, I mean, that's probably yeah, not a good he, idea. He was rock drill. what we were going to do. Yeah, that's crazy. That's what basically <laughs> what he did. He just straight up was like, hey, here's what the, this unit's going to move around and do all this. And they're like, yo, you can't say all that. It's like, so, scrap that mission, scrap that plan. Let's start. Did you guys execute the plan or were you just like, well, let's just give it a shot? I don't even remember, to be honest with you. Um, but 
the the one the one thing that we did that's you know significant um was and i could tell the story because of timmy himself but we were, we did this thing called a faint mission and we were supposed to be a decoy to move up to the town of Alhilla, and we were supposed to draw like two enemy brigades out of Karbala to over to Alhilla because we wanted to be like we were the main effort. And then the, the then we were supposed to move through Karbala and up to Baghdad. And mm-hmm. that plan worked, but it worked too good in the aspect of we left out that morning, rolled straight up, and we drew them down to us. And then we got literally got blocked in. So oh, no. the fight started like uh, it was literally like game on. We're in a one three sitting in between right behind the commander and they're all in Abrams because it was a tank battalion, right? And uh, right, right. it was about 10 feet, 10, I say 10 feet, 10 meters from the tank. A, uh, i trying to think of the name, 122 millimeter artillery shell goes off. Oh, yeah. And that's so they and it it literally blows us out like blows us off it, and it was so movie-esque when you think about like you couldn't hear anything except for pot, like just a solid ring and you're looking around oh, and it's like dust yeah. and like it's slow motion really you're like so man is this really happening and i'm looking at, I'm, I'm searching the guys and take hey are we okay and uh everybody was fine but that was the start of the fight and so we were just being ambushed from both sides of the road. So I'm calling in airstrikes and Timmy is, uh, you know, he, he's just shooting every, but everything we can. And yeah. the, the small gist of the story is that we run out of ammo. So we get down to like last mag in the, in the entire, and we had cases of, you know, ammo in the, in the track with us. Yeah, yeah. We get down to literally last mag. Timmy's God like, damn. he gets on the radio. So Timmy gets on the radio and he calls the, the, the S3, or, so he was in the tank behind us. He's like, hey, you got anything? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we got some. Because they're just buttoned down. That was the other thing, too. They're in the tank, just hatches buttoned down, yeah, shooting they the don't gun. Care. You know, it didn't matter to them. And we're right. in this 113 that literally had, it gets shot all up. It's got bullet holes all in it by the time this battle's over. And so I use my last mag and cover Timmy, and he gets out and runs like 100 yards a, like through bullet fire, he's getting shot at both sides of the road. Grabs this, grabs the ammo, runs back and and dives back into the track. And then we rearm and are able to continue to fight. And um, you know, for him to do that as an A one C, he got a bronze star with Valor as an A one C. And that's Man, pretty. It almost seems like it you know, should have been a little more, maybe. You know, for putting himself in harm's way know, like that. You know, he put himself in harm's way, and you know, we I forget this write up, but we had like at least six confirmed kills you know, through, yeah. through that fight of just like small arms fire. And cause those dudes are within, Did you, guys, you know, 50 yards of us uh, on both sides of the road. So. You guys have a 50 on top or anything or no? Yeah, we had, we had a 50 cal and that guy was and, and the army guy and he was unloading and shooting when he could, you know, and, and then uh, yeah, yeah. ultimately they ended up running out of ammo also. And there wasn't much you could do about it. Um, so yeah. it resulted to a, uh, Apaches coming in when, when I when I had Apaches coming in doing gun runs, that kind of ended the the our up close battles, you know. Yeah. But it, it was probably I don't know. It's probably like a six hour fight. It was it was a good one though. And I, wow. I remember, I just remember when it was done, like you're tired, like the adrenaline that you know the adrenaline was over, and you're like, oh man, I'm just going to take a nap. <laughs> so a lot of guys talk about really, that. Yeah, it's it's a real thing, I guess. So yeah. Um, Laying down, taking a nap while they're clearing some. Uh, they had already they had already cleared the, low, the the buildings and they were just doing SSE. And I was like, you know, I had airplanes checked off, so I was like, all right, I'm just going to chill for a second. And gunshot rings out, like boom! I wake up, I'm like, what the hell? And uh, the uh, commander's calling over the radio. What's going on, Air Force? You guys got contact? And I look up, and Timmy is standing there with his nine mil like this. And smiling, and he's like, "Damn, I'm more accurate with my nine mil than I am with my F4." He just popped off around and shot a stop sign just to see what <laughs> what we can get into. <laughs> and I'm like, "Teddy, you know, it's so, a war zone, but you can't just like, shoot anytime you want." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when they're doing SNC, and he just pops off around at a stop sign, <laughs> and just didn't look. He was just excited. He was like, "Damn." So, well, I mean, it's something to be uh, like, you know, you've gotten that scrape and then all, you know, you guys made it out and he was probably like, 
pretty amped up still, you know, like pretty, uh, yeah, pretty yeah. excited. There was another time when we got a, so I guess like a frog seven missile, it just hit it, hit one of our talks and killed some people. So they were like, Hey, be on the lookout. Well, we found three of them in the woods, like set up in their, in their orchards, ready to go. Really? And so we pulled up to them and they were, either they saw us coming or they were whatever, but they were abandoned. Like we didn't have any engagements there, but what we did yeah. have is, um, one, the, the batteries wouldn't start. So they ended up towing it. And then I got to drive one. Nice. And then there was another, so, so we're driving and we co-take these three frogs seven missiles with missiles on them. Right. And drive under this big intersection on the highway. And, and then what, what goes through my mind at the time was, uh, I just hear this F six or F 18 above me, just circling right above me. Oh man. I didn't even and, think about that. Yeah. So he was circling right above me and I was like, I got up on guard and I was like, Hey, <laughs> Any any F eighteen over this location, grid coordinate. These friend, these are friendlies in this frog. Do not engage. Oh. You know? Did you I was hold of them or, uh... Um. Well, they didn't engage us. And thank God. So, but it was a uh, yeah. I did, oh man, dude, where'd you end up this, taking them to? Uh, they took them to this intersection, and then at that point, we had did a battlefield handover, and they. So it was like a big highway intersection. We we parked all three of them next to each other, and then we moved on and pushed on with the fight. I'm not sure when if we handed over to the people behind us and okay. just continued because this was on the way up to Baghdad. So it wasn't like we were we were stopping anywhere for any significant time. Right, right. You know. Yeah. So you so basically you guys are just. I mean, it was, it's kind of like you see in the movies. I mean, you just keep pushing and pushing. You know, you may get in some uh, maybe a battle here or a fight here, and then you just deal with it and just keep going on. Yeah, that's how it was. I mean, we we held up. I'm, I can't remember the first two or, two or so weeks into it was the first time we even got a shower. We found some bus station, this Greyhound bus station that we held up in the night. <laughs> and got showers. It felt so good. But we went all the way up to the airport and stayed at the airport. You know, one of the terminals there. Wow. Did you guys get in any, uh, any other significant uh, battles or anything or any, anything before or after you dropped off the frogs? There was... There was more skirmishes, but nothing to the level of, of that. Yeah, of that one. Of the one in that hill. So, were you were the four of you still together in that one one three, or was JC and somebody? No, in, so, um, no it was me and Timmy in the one one three. Yeah, it was me and Timmy in the one one three, and JC was in JC and Nate were at the talk. So oh, okay, so we had rolled back like, I mean, a couple miles away, right? We just pushed forward to from from the talk that morning just to do the decoy mission. Oh, okay. I mean, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of other, you know, small engagements that took place. Um, sure. Even after Shropshire, you know, after that bridge incident where he got the Silver Star, there was still, I mean, you still had burning bodies laying all over the place because they just smoked them and then they rolled on, right? So sure. we got to deal with the people coming to recover them. Uh, and so that was still. And they weren't always friendly, I'm sure. You know, no, no, that was, there, there was, there was many more little gunfights that happened after that, not to the tune of that they had to deal with. They left. They left a lot of people laying around, but they got basically ambushed in an intersection by a bridge. Yeah. You know, so that was a good, that was a good fight for them. Guys. So you got to Baghdad or you got to the airport. How long were you in Iraq? I mean, how long did all that take to get up to, up to Baghdad? Well, once we got established in Baghdad or at the airport, I remember being there at least another month where we were, you know, I mean, cause we even got put on like burn duty, you know, and we were, and I remember traveling around this, we were traveling around Baghdad downtown you know, with soft, soft hummers with no, you know, no doors on. Like this is before IEDs were really a threat. If you think about it. Yeah. yeah. And then when people started having IEDs and started shooting, that's when we started armoring up the vehicles, but none of our vehicles were armored when we took them over there. Um, I think I probably got back from that deployment and like, so the, the fight was really in March started it. That fight was in April, like the first day, I think it was that first day, of April. And then yeah. by the time we got to Baghdad, I think I got home in like July. Like it wasn't, it wasn't crazy. It was June, July time frame We came home yeah. from the first deployment. Ended up going back like the next year. So that was July. Ended up deploying again in 04. Um, and I did that. This one was eight months, but I did like back to back. I did a four month one down in Armadi. Mm -hmm. And then, and it was fairly insignificant. You know, as far as there was the missions that we did, there was, we covered a down helicopter. That was not a good site. You know, it was, they had a, I'd say a 53 went down 
but they were carrying a bunch of ammo and and that like oh, man. pilots were still in the seats you know you could see like it was bad we had to secure the site until they because we were the closest people so they sent us out to secure the site until yeah. they could come to cover it but after the deployment to armani i ended up staying and going up to baghdad and got into the fallujah 04 the november fallujah 04 fight so that was good i needed to do i was getting divorced at the time so i needed to stay and make money so i was like i'll volunteer to do another so i did like eight months over there little did you know it was going to be fallujah <laughs> yeah when you went over <laughs> right it was the second fallujah so you had a spring 04 and then the november 04 and you know, yeah that was it how was that, that that was another interesting day um a lot of death you know we lost a lot of marines yeah. in that fight i you know the thing and i don't i'm not a you know a, a planner that but one of the things I remember that didn't make sense to me was we basically cord on off the city and gave them like three days to leave. So there was all the civilians were trying to get out, you know, cause they knew it was going to be a bad fight. And the thought was, Hey, anybody that stays is staying to fight. But I think about how many high level bad guys got out. Right. In, in yeah, way, a, yeah. we really did it. They didn't want to stay there and just get smoked there. So they're like, they're going to bug out and maybe try to fight another day. Yep. Yeah. And that was just daily mortar fires. Just, you know, it's, it's so weird because, and you know what I'm talking about, how unsensitive we get to things when it's sure. just repeating, right? So we took mortar fire from the OP because we were out of this little OP. And at least a dozen times a day, you would take mortar rounds to where it's like it would hit close and splash up mud on the on the windshield of the Humvee. You'd be like, yeah. oh, that one's close. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't. You just get desensitized to to that, yeah. but that was Man. that was a good one. I got I got called in some airstrikes in that, and and you know earned my keep during that battle too. Yeah. So then, how uh, long were you on the OP? Oh, like a, seems like it was a couple of weeks. You know that we were doing that. It seems it seems like the the fight was like all in November, but I don't think it lasted a whole month. You know, it just seemed like it because we were out there for the whole quarter and off the city. And then, right. Um, but that was just, you know, clearing through the city of uh, Fallujah. That just, like I said, we lost a lot of people on that one. I mean, we yeah. obviously we, we won the battle, but we took sure. a lot of casualties. Was it um, just, we didn't, I, see, I try to always figure out, or I try to think about like how we lost all the casualties. Was it just the situation, like coming into the city? I mean, Anytime you're in an urban environment like that and you're going house to house, I mean, it's, you're just waiting. Yes. It's, it's easy for the enemy to attack as opposed to you defending, you know, like you're just, exactly. you and that's, anywhere that's what it was. you had, uh, we were basically going door to door clearing houses. Right. And yeah, you go up the stairs and they got the high ground on you. So, right. you know, dudes were, we were losing dudes getting shot in the stairwells, um, in the streets, they'd be out on the rooftops shooting down as you move through and you were just, they just constantly had the, uh, the advantage. Sure. And you couldn't just go in and blanket airstrike, right? It's it's urban, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So that, so it's you know you know how it is. It's real. It's real tough to fight that urban fight, yeah, especially is. when you're not fighting. Uh, by this time, I would say we, you know, we were not fighting like the Republican Guard. You were fighting a little. Yeah, it's more like an insurgency at that point rather yeah, than uh, you were fighting an insurgency. Yep. So guys with RPGs and AKs, and, and, and how hard it is to, to fight onesies and twosies. Oh. it's almost you know? impossible and that, i'm sure that's why the, we lost so many guys because you know you look at a guy and he's like well is that a, he looks the bad guys look just like the good guys so you know if he's not holding something at that point he's a good guy right. and then he can just pick up a, an rpg or a rifle later on and now he's a bad guy so yeah it's yeah it's such a impossible situation yeah well yep. so it's from that aspect it's like man this is but Ultimately, we ended up winning, and and I went home. I was home by Christmas of that year. So yeah, and then, uh, nice. but then I ended up going to the seventeenth by June of '05. So I had okay. by that time I had transitioned and went down to seventeenth. So you were in. Uh, you came from Riley, and you got. I think at that point, were we still doing? We weren't doing selections then. We were still doing like uh, you did your own yeah, kind of selection. Was, like I'm not. I'm not afraid to admit that I was still part of the paper selection package that went in. <laughs> you right. know, 
Hey, so, I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't like somebody just looked at you and was like, "Yeah, hey, come on over." I mean, I everybody had to kind of do their own physical and you know stuff at the. Oh at yeah, you had, the test. You had to go do like the the three PT test three days in a row, run the ten yeah. mile. You know, you had to do all the things at the twelve mile run for time. Right, I had to right. do, that, but I just didn't go through the the week long assessment that they do now. Right. I would like to think that I still would have made it if I had went through the assessment, but <laughs> you know, you never know. I know it's. It's, it's getting challenging, but I like it. It has morphed into, it, it was started as kind of rough, but now I guess I was talking to Kevin and he was saying it was pretty wire tight. I mean, it was pretty, well, I don't, he was I, either him or somebody was saying that it was very objective. You know what? There's no like feelings involved. There's no like, you know, if a guy doesn't like you, you know, he can't just get you out now. So, um, uh, not that, that I'm not saying that that happened, but now it's real objective. Did you meet these? you know, this criteria. Okay, cool. Then you, you move on or whatever. So I think it's, a, I think it's, it's exponentially better than it started or whatever. But. The one thing that they're doing is that's almost proven to be fact is that whatever the psych says, they take the psych recommendation very serious. Smart. And their record, their, their record has been like all the guys that the psych said, don't take that we took became problem people. Really? Yeah. Huh. For the most part that I saw. I mean, I guess that makes sense. I mean, there's probably red flags that these guys just see, you know, the psychs are like, no, I mean, that's, we've seen this a hundred times. It always happens this way. Don't take this guy. And it sucks too, because that could be the one thing that stops the guy from going, you know, he may be in stellar shape and just a great JTAC and, you know, just an awesome guy, but he has that one, you know, mental deficiency, if you want to call it. And that, yeah. And we're like, ah, just, he can get over that. But usually that's the thing you can't get over is that mental well, that's what they do. It's usually like, you know, they find a way to figure out if you're going to be a team player, if you can, if you're going to be successful as a team member, and not just yeah. as a as an individual, right? And then whether or not you have tendencies of like, you got a temper, and you're trying to fight a lot or something like that. Like they figure that all that stuff out. It's like about, yeah. And then whether or not you have the cognitive ability to to do the task that you know that you have to do at that level, right? Like control five or six assets at once or, you know, right. integrate them into a detailed special operations plan it's, or some sort. Yeah. yeah, I mean, think about it. Not that that tech piece schoolhouse was easy, but as long as you were strong and you didn't quit, you were going to pretty much make it through. Pretty much, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you really had to – and with and with good reason because, like, we're, you know, everybody was kind of young at that point, so they know who they're getting at that point. So, so you got to the 17th and you went right to 3rd Battalion at that point or – yeah, so I, I did. I went to Charlie Company Third Battalion, and um, loved my time there. I mean, I got to. That's one of the things I liked about Ranger that was different than the the ODA style mm-hmm. guys. Is like we were integrated with our with the with the Army, integrated with the team. Um, yeah, I mean, I literally had a desk in their office. <laughs> right. You know, so was, I would do PT with them. Like we we would just integrated as a team and they trusted me as as much as they trust their own guys and sure. and that that reciprocated down range with with the, the missions that we were doing versus and i'm not saying it's the case but i hear it over and over from sf dudes you know you show up in the first time you meet your teams in country on a lot of times and yeah you know sometimes they don't like you sometimes they do you always right. gotta you show up and you have to earn their respect versus right. i, I use you know i earned their respect in the garrison so they knew by the time that we were deployed, they didn't have to see whether or not I was going to meet the task. And it wasn't even so much that it was like, where's Richie? Like we're deploying where, where's, where's my yeah. day Like he needs to come yeah. with us. They, it was more like asking for the specific dude, you know, and that's a good point. Cause SF guys would, do, I've heard of people doing that. Like ODAs will be like, Hey, where's this guy? I've worked with him before. And unfortunately there's not enough JTACs to go around for OD. Cause there's a, a ton of ODAs. Um, and they couldn't get the guy, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, I, I wish I, and I, you know, when I was in a, in a leadership position there, I was always tr- trying to find a way to outfit every ODA with a JTAC. But I mean, there's so many, it's just impossible. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not, we would, it, we'd have to make them. I don't know. I, I I think the numbers are just too, too great to, to make that happen, but you're right. The rent with the Rangers, it was like, that's that construct. The way we did it would kind of alleviated all that need to, even even like a personality thing, you know, you didn't even have to like try to figure out 
is how was this guy, you know, cause you were, you talked to him all the time. You probably drank beer with him down at the uh, scruffy Murphy's or something, or, you know, I mean, so oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that would, you know, you'd be at barbecues at the commander's house and like, they all trust. Right. You. Right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I, I like personally, I've always liked the, uh, kind of the, the structure and discipline of the Rangers um, yeah. versus SF, you know, but that's just a personal preference. For sure. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, uh, and that's a good point because there's a lot of guys that would prefer it the other way and thrive and do great mm -hmm. things. And there's guys like us who, you know, kind of fit in there uh, for me, I, I can speak for about myself. It, I needed that structure to keep me in line kind of, you know what I mean? Like, it was like, Hey, yeah. this is, this is what we expect yeah. of you. I'm like, okay. And uh, now I got some left and right, you know, limits, you know, and uh, kind of kept me in line a little more than I think if I'd have been left to my own devices at some sort of ODA or in that more lackadaisical when I was younger, obviously, but I think it would have been maybe a little different, but yeah, I, I like the structure. And from the mission, I like the direct action versus, Hey, you guys want to go ride around in a convoy and see if we get shot at today? You know, oh my God, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Oh, I'd much yeah. rather have them on the objective and, and take the fight to them. Than, For sure. Then react to contact. Yeah. And that's not to say they didn't have missions. They did go do missions, but for sure, I spoke to so many dudes that were at the that supported ODAs, and they're like, "Yeah, man, sometimes we just went and look for fights." Yeah, you know, with very little. And what I didn't like about it was um, they had very little air support. You know, like we every time we went out, you know, you had like like I said, like four or five assets on station. With them, it was like you might have some artillery, or you maybe you might have a right. an they, ISR platform. So. That, that's absolutely correct. You know, it's you, you know what we used to get. And the dedicated lines every night versus, you know, they had one gunship to support all the ODAs in the country. Yeah. You know, and we would get two gunships every night. Right. Exactly. You know, I know. So, I know. But they uh, had some really good deployments with the Rangers. Um, to crit was a really good one. And that was kind of back in, aside from the initial invasion, when the, when the fight was on, you know, mm -hmm. 06 to 08 in Iraq was, 07 specifically, was just good years for fighting. You know, we yeah. were still chasing big big game guys. And there was just, you're going out on a mission every night. It made the deployment go by quick. And you were just getting it every night. It, versus later on, you know, by the time I was leaving, I left in 11. And I just remember sitting over there like, geez, like you might go a week without going on a mission. It's like, why, why are we still here? Why are we doing this? All right. <laughs> Not like it was in the beginning. Does anything stand out to you when you were at, at battalion? Um, like when you're doing those missions, like uh, where they all just, or they all just kind of run together. I mean, which that's kind of the way it was for me. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I mean, I remember particular missions that we got into that were really, well, so there, there's like, there's this one mission that we called, I think the chicken coop. And um, it was, that was one that stood out because we, we did offset infill, walked in, and there was a uh, basically a foreign fighters sitting on top of there. There was four chicken coops, two two like here running east to west, and two running east to west across like a fifty yard field. And they're big long buildings that literally were chicken coops. And they had a, these foreign fighters on the top of them. And so we set up on one side and then maneuvered a unit around to the other side. And the snipers got up on the roof and they sniped the Roman guard. And that woke everybody up. And as soon as that happened, our guys went up on top of the rooftop and killed those guys on the rooftop. Yeah. So that drew some attention that we weren't expecting. And this is why I love the Rangers. They had a, we had a young private pulling rear security. And while the fight was definitely facing the other direction and we were, that's where everybody was shooting. Like we were all shooting. Everything was going down. And this run Rangers pulling rear security and what happens, like, out of nowhere comes these three guys up from, to try to get us from behind. And he's like, contact. And he shoots the guy. And I duck under him. And then we shoot him. And then, so we kill two. And then chase one into the uh, into the chicken coop. But had he not been doing his job, like, how easy would it be to take your attention oh. off the rear when everybody's fighting with your, you know, behind you? And you're like, I want yeah. some action, too. But this dude, this dude maintained his discipline and kept, kept rear security. Oh, man, I and, love it. And so we ended up going to the chicken coop and um, I remember going online and walking. I'm like literally kicking thousands of chickens out of the way. Like they're just everywhere <laughs> and it's dark. And this, we get to like the last pylon and we like, we know he's in there because we saw him. He goes, he went through the door 
Yeah. And he just happened to pop out right in front of me. And I got to canoe the dude from like two feet away. Oh and, my God. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, and <laughs> the fact that it's on video too. So, Oh yeah. So we had a combat camera guy, you know, they, they were attached to us and he was, he, he saw the fight or he got video of the fight from the rear security stuff. It was pretty good. So it kind of made that, okay. you know, how we used to do those end of deployment films. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> the, the deployment wrap ups. So it made it yeah, in yeah. one of those pretty good. Oh, it did. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, man. You just never know when stuff like that's going to happen. You know, I mean, like Tom it, Case, it, he calls it the wrong place, right time or whatever. But yeah, just it's always timing, man. I, it's it's not that any one of us have ever been any better than the other dudes. We just you just get lucky. You never know when the yeah. enemy is going to pop up and fight. And yep, as long as you're not backing down, everybody's going to have the same result. Right, right. There was there was other ones. We had suicide vests. We had. Uh, I mean, there was one funny story I remember that was we had. Like my second or third year, it's probably my second year at Charlie Company. There was a new commander that, that came in, and I don't know his name, and I wouldn't say it if I did, but I didn't like him, and nobody liked him. He was just a dick, Aww. right? Yeah. And so, and you know me, man. I can get along with anybody, and right. but this dude was just if, a dick. yeah. If you're calling him a dick, if you're if you're you're yeah. not getting along with him, then there's something wrong with the dude for sure. And you know, keep in mind, I'm only like a tech or staff at times, so I'm. It's not like I'm anybody compared to this captain that was the company commander and um uh, anyways what i remember though was he ssc in a house and he's walking around the outside and we're just about to go and he falls into a shit hole which was like an eight foot shit hole right on the side of the house and oh, literally man. underwater bleep, and we have to pull him out oh. of a shit hole oh. and it was like it was satisfying because it's like yeah you got what you deserve <laughs> of all the but people that go in there but was it was the commander of all the people. And then um I let my me think of another story too. But the uh of all the people. So then but then he we had to ride on the helicopter back with him, you know, and he's literally oh, smelled man. like shit. And then this dude, just to show that, like when I say this dude was a dick, he put his dirty shit laundry into the laundry with everybody else's and it ruined everybody's laundry. You know, instead of just throwing away his clothes, he put it in with everybody else's clothes. Yeah. That reminded me of a story, though. We were there was one mission we were out chasing some foreign fighters, and uh, this is one where the little birds were shooting, you know, doing uh, squirter control with their mm -hmm. M4s, you know, off the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. So they got a guy, and we had a sniper setting up on OP. And what it was was this this bad guy and his wife who was pregnant um, took over some house in the village. And they, you know, just kind of held up the house and was like, "Hey, we're staying here," and yeah. we because we were chasing them, so went in and got him. He fled out into the vineyard. Ultimately, he got his one of his nuts shot off by the little bird gun runs. And oh my God, his, yeah, and his pregnant wife picked up a gun and walked across the windows, and the sniper shot her. So they Jeez. killed her, and because she had a gun, and um so we're like dude you're having a bad day you know you got not only is your wife and, and kid passed but now you got one testicle that was that was a bad day oh my god why i don't know what makes them do that like and i was kind of talking to somebody else about this like the kind of the sanctity of life thing where they don't they don't think about the any kind of future at all they're not like like that lady she's you know has a baby it's like maybe just chill out you made me just hold you know just maybe just give up you know be treated you know but she was like no nope, i'm gonna take the fight to him and man it's unfortunate you know it, the, and it is, a, i've always said that too it's hard to fight somebody that doesn't have a regard for life like the americans right. like, like like we have a regard for life like not that we won't go to fight anybody but you don't see americans blowing each other up like suicide vest you don't we don't do exactly. that right because we right. value life they you can yeah. look at how many martyrs sign up for that stuff Oh yeah, yeah. That's it's yeah, it's because they they get in that line of bull that you know if you do it then you're going to be rewarded and it's like so the, people just line up around the block to do that kind of stuff and it's like no, I mean yeah, it's it, it's tra it can be tragic like that lady you know, yeah. <laughs> but and there's so I mean do you think that guy got his nut shot off by the guy with M4 in the bird or did, or, or their guns on the bird? No, he like got the, shot off on it. 
the, the de- they shot them with the little bird guns, not the not the okay. M4. They were just I doing containment fires shot. with the M4. Nah, it was the uh, it was the mini guns, M60 or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jesus, yeah, that was a bad day for me. Man, that was about as bad as the guy that. Another instance, we chased a guy. He went down in a creek, and we were like couldn't find him, but the the sensors overhead were spotting him, and they could find him. So we talked yeah. him on. And he was hiding in the creek, like just barely breathing out of the water with his trough. So we we pull him out, hog tie him, and we go get his buddy like a hundred meters down. And our, we had dogs with us. You know, you know how mean those dogs were. Oh yeah, they're, they're dogs, right? Relentless. So, so we go down, get the other guy out, and then as we're tying the other dude up. That dog takes off and runs back like the hundred yards, and gets a hold of the other guy's leg that's hog tied, and just oh really? And we try to, yeah, so we try to chase him down, but you know it's like ten seconds, ten fifteen seconds to get the hundred yards running in right. full kit, and that dog. Had oh yeah, yeah. Good, he's way ahead of you. He had a good fifteen seconds of just buffet on that guy's leg, and then that caused issues because literally we had to life flight the guy. They got into his. He just tore up the back of his, like his femoral artery in his leg. Oh, jeez! He was bleeding out. What made the dog go back to that guy? He wasn't a threat. I don't know. He just didn't like him. You know. <laughs> you know when they were just barking. I, like, I think oh, you know yeah, what because yeah. we were cutting him out of the water. He tried to kick at him. Oh, you know, okay. When you're, so, so he already had. You know, a, he, already, he didn't like the him dog's like barking down on him, and you know the the guy the handlers got him. He's like doing all this saying fooey all his different things that he says but but he went back and got yeah. that guy you don't think you don't think about a dog like holding a grudge or like having some memory like that but they do they they remember you kick him you know as you're coming out of the water like as we were restraining him he would kick in and fight and then he kicked the dog you know so. nah, not good but there's i mean dude there's a million of those stories i'm sure yeah i'm sure you could just like one would lead to the other i mean it just there's so much that happens when you're deployed that you don't even think about that you just forget it, yeah, almost forget. as soon as it happens. But mm-hmm. um, after I left Charlie Company, at some point, you know, they had. I went to Recce, did a yep. deployment with Recce, and then from, and that's when you were in charge of RRC at the time or RD at the time. Yeah, and yeah. you were going to pull me over, but I had to. Mark Foster got dibs in front of me. Oh, I did. <laughs> yeah. What was the deal? Talk me through that. I don't remember that. I don't know. You had, going of course, on? I reckon you were going to pull me back. You were like, hey, man, I'm going to be in the supervisor. You're going to come over to RD at, when you get back from deployment. Oh, then, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I do remember that now. Yeah. Mark had to, in, in fairness, he was completely in. He'd been there so much longer than me. That, yeah, a little you know, bit more seniority, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was yeah, deserving. I, he was deserving. I remember I kind of felt bad about that, too, because I, I hate telling somebody something and then, you know, being trumped by somebody else, you know, and I'm like, well, I yeah. just told this guy he was coming. So now, but how long? So how long after that did we get you back over there? Oh, uh, I did like one more deployment. Okay. So it was within a, you know an, within the year. Okay. Oh, that's and good. I think I went to RD in like 2008. Okay. Something like that. So it had been about three years of battalion, and then between battalion and recce, and then then over to RD. So you can talk about whatever you want for RD, but um, uh. What I remember is, and we kind of talked about this already, but there's very few people in this in this world, let alone our small community, that have um, a combat military freefall jump. And uh, I remember we're like I said, we we're talking about it. I remember we all came into work one day. I can't remember exactly what the details of the whole thing were, but you were gone. Like you had nobody knew where you went, uh, or maybe somebody did. I didn't know where you went. Um, and it was just one of those things where it was like something we needed. They needed a team and you guys went and it was very hush hush. And do, can you talk about any of that stuff or is that still uh, classified or do you want to I talk? Know any, I wouldn't know any difference and I can generalize it and just say that, um, yes. Yeah, so we, we did get a, a jump mission and, you know, we trained for it for a little bit. And um, the, the part that was, tough for guys for the other guys is you know we all we're all happy for each other but you're jealous of each other at the same time with sure. somebody doing something else right for and sure. when you train a mission like like a level one train up and how many jumps you do training and in, in garrison you know you hope that one day you're going to get to do that 
And, right. and I just was fortunate. We talk about timing and on my first RD deployment, I got to go do that. Yeah. And it's like dudes have been doing years on the teams and didn't get to do it. Yeah. And it was, I just got lucky. So, you know, I remember Mark Foster being like, I freaking hate you, but I'm glad for you. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That's, I think we all felt that way. Yeah. Like, yeah. man, that'd been awesome to do, but we're, you know, we're happy for you. Yeah. Can you talk about yeah, any that details was, uh, or like, was it just that? Was yeah, it so even, we, sometimes those are just not there. It's a combat jump, but it's not like a, uh, like a static line combat jump where you're under fire or whatever. It's probably, it's more because by de- by definition, that military freefall mission is a, is a supposed to be a more clandestine infiltration rather than a, you know, nobody yes, should know you're there, I guess. That's kind of the gist of it. So we, uh, yeah. we jumped into, we jumped in our airspace, right? Yeah. And, and, and we did a hey-ho, hey-ho, it wasn't really a hey-ho. We jumped to 17,000, but it was down in south. Uh, it was like two hours south of Kandahar. So it was down in okay. Barishaw, which is like on the Paki border. So, um, and then we had, we, the team sergeant tandem and somebody, and then, because nice. um, well, you already know this, I got messed up on that jump. I, and I hate to, you know, you hate to admit it like, oh, yeah, I got messed up. But, yeah, about, <laughs> I think seven of the eight guys got pretty messed up, but I was the worst by far. Um, oh, man. So, I, so it started with this, though. I, I think the reason was this. When we, we rehearsed and we planned, and there was no, we had a hard time getting imagery of this location. Like we had to literally put in requests to say to get industry in the imagery and the stuff we had was kind of dated. Yeah. And so we picked a, we picked a DZ, a primary DZ or LZ and uh, yeah, DZ, we picked, picked a DZ and that was the plan. And we were going to go from there and we're literally plane side, just reenlisted a guy on the ramp um, plane side after we're jocked up and like the S2 drives out, hey, we got uh, we got ISR overhead right now. You can't, you need to find your, push to your alternate DZ that's a Bedouin camp. So right where we planned on jumping was a Bedouin camp. So we're like, all right, push the alternate DZ. Well, the alternate DZ on imagery looked like a dry riverbed. And it was not a dry riverbed. It looked like a washout in the Grand Canyon. You know, you'd be like flat for 10 feet and then like an eight foot dip down fingers. Just a, It was just horrible. And, oh, um, man. And to the tune of when when we we were doing the debrief, and the the U twenty eight guys were arguing with each other, the pilots were arguing back and forth. They're like, "That can't be where they're jumping. Look at it." And <laughs> oh my God. they're like, "No, I'm telling you, I confirmed the grid with them. This is where they're jumping." And so, because their mission was they were going to sparkle the LZ force for oh, the DZ, nice. and uh, and so they did. But you know, with them with them being overhead, they're they're like, "Dude, that's." That's going to hurt. And it did. <laughs> and so the last thing I remember was coming in on final and I was right behind the team sergeant and, uh, and he was you know, like the tandem and he, uh, next thing I know, like I remember flaring. And then the next thing I know, I wake up and I see a parachute in front of me. My helmet's off my head. My nods are broke. And, and I'm like, I look around, I'm like, oh, mountains. I was like, oh. And I thought I was in Arizona. I thought we were in Arizona doing a level one train up. <laughs> and, oh, my God. Yeah, I didn't know where I was. So, <laughs> and then I hear, I pick up my headset and I put on my radio and I hear the U-28s. And I'm like, well, they never come to Arizona. This is weird, right? Like, <laughs> so it was weird. And then I hear the, the team starts calling me with the radio. He's like, hey, where are you at? Where are you at? And uh, I'm like, I don't know. I told him I thought I was in Arizona. And so, <laughs> oh my God. So he's like, turn on your strobe, turn on my strobe. And he's like, oh, I see you. You're just right there. But I was only like 50 feet from him, but it was like on a, a 50 feet below him, you know, just oh the wash out there. And I guess I had come in and tumbled pretty hard. And so they made us jump full body armor, knee pads, and helmets along with the rucksack, right? And generally we wouldn't jump all that. You would just, you know what it's like when you're training that. Yeah, yeah. And, but it's a good thing I did put on knee pads because I shattered both knee pads. And I never shattered knee pads before. But I shattered yeah, I've both never even pads. seen that happen before. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so if I wasn't wearing knee pads, I probably would have been a medevac and ruined the mission. Um, my helmet, though, this is where the concern was. Like, I broke the nods off the front. I smashed the, the strobe on top of my helmet was smashed. Both sides, like your call sign side on the helmet and the flag side, both had like scratches to where it was like wore through the call sign patch. And then the back of my helmet had a gash like four inches long and like a quarter inch thick, like in the Kevlar. What? Like it gashed straight up the back of my helmet and it broke my helmet. And uh, so all I think is that I just came in and just did some flips or something. But I was knocked yeah. out for like I was knocked out for like 30 minutes. And Wait, so, uh, so you remember flaring. Yeah, you must have just went right out then. You must yeah, have just remember, hit and then. I remember flaring and then I remember waking up and thinking I was in Arizona. And. <laughs> And the time, by this time, you know, they, they, they determined it was about a 30 minute time I was knocked out based on the, the events because everybody else who, who was hurt, most everybody else was hurt from the, the landing, but yeah. they all de rigged and went to the assembly area and, and they were waiting for me. And I was still laying on the ground somewhere. Um, so the medic, uh, a good buddy of mine, Carl Nicholson, ended up giving me a shot of Toradol in the ass and then kind of brought me back to back to life and then i grabbed control of the birds and then we continued the mission and then walked out by sunlight we didn't make it as far as we were supposed to but we made it enough to where we could get picked up by helicopter and then that was that was it um there was Everybody's there was we were walking. nearly compromised but not yeah so out on the dz or in route in route to the mission well oh, so okay. from the dz up until what we were doing on the on the mountain and then um, cause there's a bunch of go herders up there, right? Yeah. And so everywhere. Always. everywhere. <laughs> so that, I mean, they, they were literally like, they saw him and they're like, are we gonna have to kill this guy? Like, what are we going to do? Like, <laughs> yeah, just keep being compromised, but they didn't. And we were successful in the mission. Good. Good but, deal. But yeah. I think, I think, yeah. uh, I don't know for sure, but I know that, that, you know, Jason Quisenberry's Q, he's, mm -hmm. he was like one of the first one, I think. And, yep. I don't know if anybody's – I'm sure there's been a lot in the past, you know, but just for attack peas, I don't know of, it, of anybody else. I can't think of anybody else besides the two of you that uh, – uh, and I, there might be, but I, I don't know about it. You know right. what I mean? I mean, you know, there's, a, there's lots of guys doing stuff all the time, so I'm not naive yeah. to think that nobody else has. I just don't know of them. Maybe guys out of brag like, or something that we don't know about. Right. And there's yeah. – you know, there's – and that's not to be said. Like you said, it's not unheard of. It's just not common. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know what is common though? Like you said that you said the jump was kind of hard. I know Q was telling me about his jump, and his was kind of the same way. I know a guy got hurt pretty bad on it. He he, there was high winds, or he something was. I mean, it wasn't. It seems like those kind of jumps, while cool in our mind, they're not the easiest things to do. I mean, they're very difficult jumps to do because you know you know all the planning that goes into and training. And then just to like pick some place out in the middle of the desert and be like, okay, we're going to jump into there. I mean, you can really screw yourself up if you land incorrectly, I, as you, as you well know, yeah. uh, you know, if you don't land right, it's, it can be bad, man. Right. And it, you know, for context, it wasn't like we were just landing in the desert. Like we were in the mountain range. So we had to find a spot in the middle. Of the Which is even worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, so. I know we but, used to try to like find austere, drop zones to kind of practice that kind of thing. But I don't think anything's like what you did. You know what I mean? Like it, that, that's just a different scenario. It was, I'll tell you what though, it was cool though. Cause even though we were jumping to like 17,000, the DZ was at like, it was high. It was 9,000, something like that, you know? And, yeah. uh, but I remember coming down the mountain and only being like, like I'm still thousand, thousand feet of elevation but I'm only 200 feet above the mountain and I'm kind of riding the mountain down the hill as I'm falling. Yeah. It, was, it was a nice thing. That would have been a cool ride, man, for sure. Was I was cool love doing that. I was love doing hay hose. Yeah. What's, um, yeah. what back up a little bit. What's, so what kind of, did you have any like, um, like residual effects from that injury or were you just it's like, it sucked at the time, but then you kind of, you get the tour all and then you're like, okay, now I'm good. Or have you had any? Well, yeah, man. So I, you know, so kind of, I come off the, there's a picture out there that exists that I haven't, I've seen it, but I haven't, I don't have a copy of it. Um, yeah. of us standing there. As soon as we got back to Kandahar, they took a picture of us. My face is just bloody. 
and oh, dirty. And, um, but I, they sent me back from Kandahar. I went back to Bagram and got checked out like the next day. And mm-hmm. that's like, how you feel? Like, yeah, I feel fine. All right. You're good to go. Return to duty. And so then, right on. <laughs> so then I get back, I get back home station and go back in the training cycle. I'm doing a level one train up. Everything's good. And then I'm due for my fight, my annual flight physical. And mm-hmm. the doc, you know, at the time there's a guy, I think his name's doc, right? He was, he was famous for keeping guys on status. Like he would do everything he can to make sure you could do the mission. I was sure. like, Hey, I gotta, I'm about to do this annual physical. What do I say and not say? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, I tell him stories like, well, you don't have to make anything up because I'm a the nephew right now. I was like, oh, shit. So I was trying to <laughs> find a way to stay on on status. And he did me on the spot. And I had to go to Fort Girl- Gordon, I think it was, and do like this TBI testing stuff. And uh, yeah, ultimately, I ended up with a moderate TBI. And um, I had to be on a waiver for like every other year. I had to go get reevaluated at these clinics yeah, stay yeah. on a waiver you know we but, talked about that all uh, in the past too with some guys and at the time that's the shitty part is not being on status but then now as we look back on it and you sitting here it's probably a good thing he did that you know like that's that's a you're probably thankful that he said all right hold on let's go get this thing checked out because it could have been a lot worse or it could have gotten a lot worse later on so yeah you know, where, where he got me was uh he was like, do you want to end up like Muhammad Ali? And I was like, nope. You know? <laughs> no, I don't. And yeah. He's like, if you had any kind of bleeding on the brain or anything and you don't address it, he was this, you could be like this. I'm like, all right, I'll go get checked out. Yeah. But you know what I mean? From a JTAC perspective, I got the NIF, so I couldn't control and I couldn't jump. Right. Which is like the worst. Yeah, exactly. Nobody ever like, wants to, to so be in that situation. What good am I to the team if, if my sole job is that? Right. Right. And they kept me to live for like two months, two to three months. So that was cool. But like you said, in the end state, I'm glad that he did it. And that's in your records. And now you can, you know, because if you have not given my 20% for the VA for a moderate TBA. (laughs) Exactly. Well, you wouldn't have got that uh, if you wouldn't have, if you would have hit it, you know, I mean, then later on, you got to try to tell the VA, no, no, it really happened. I just, you know, it's just a big mess. So yeah, it's kind of nice. It's kind of good. It's good in the long run that, the guy made you get it all checked out and everything. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy about it. So then you went, you were, um, so you, did you leave the 17th from RD or RC? Yeah. Yeah, I did. So, okay. And, and this was a time when we, I don't know the right answer, but you know, we, we faced it. The, the, the issue you face with RD is, and it, it may be different now because guys go to selection now and they do OTC and stuff, but mm-hmm. you know, for us, you had to spend time in battalion and then you could go to RD. So by the time right. you got there and did a couple of years, you had been in the unit five, six, eight years, you know, guys foster 10 years. And, yeah. and that's a lot of deployments and time away from home and all that stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, and my lovely wife, you know, at the time me and her had like a, a newborn and a 15 month old. And so right. she's like, yo, all these deployments, she, she basically said, I feel like a prostitute babysitter. You come into town, we bang out, pack your bags, and I watch your kids. She's like, you know, I didn't know this is what I was signing up for. Because I told her yeah. when we first got together, it's like, hey, are you, are you, she never dated a military guy before. She was a young girl. She was only 20 years old. And uh, I was like, I want to make sure that you could that you know what you're getting into, right? And so I told her I wouldn't marry her until she made it through two deployments in ranger school. And so I did deployment, went to ranger school in between deployments, and then deployed again. And, you know, I was like, all right, well, she seems solid. But, she stuck around. But so you, do, like- you stuck around, and then, then you still get the ultimatum. And you're like, hey, man, this isn't, you know, an ultimate to the point of like, hey, you really need to find something else to do. And by this time, they were going to replace me with Justin Foles, but his replacement didn't show up. So he had I had to wait like another year because he didn't get oh. backfilled, you know. And ultimately, like you you get burnt out, you know. You're like, hey, I just I just want I need a break. I need one deployment off. Yeah, 
And Tom, Tom was just talking about that the other day. Yeah, he said the same thing. And we, I think we all feel that way. Yeah. And and when you factor, like, if you go deployment, range school deployment, you know, all the training that you do back in the rear, there's just no time off. I mean, even when you were home, you were doing three weeks on the road, TDY. And then the fourth week, you'd be at the range doing night shooting. So you really weren't spending quality time anyways, you exactly. know, at home. So, um, and that's the nature of the beast. But, you know, just having one time where you could be home for a couple, like, four months and that would have been good. And we just didn't have that ability to do that because nope. demanding. Yeah, we, had, we had just enough men, if not, we, we some at the, optimally, we had just enough men to fill all the squares, you know, to, to meet all the missions. And sometimes we didn't even have that. And some guys had to, you know, like Tommy was talking about, he had to like well, cover for other guys. I picked up, guys and, yeah, I had to know. pick up for Matty Green because he, uh, he went to selection. Right. Right. So, yep. You know, and that was, you know, that's just like we said, it's just the nature of, of what it was dealing with. So, so I looked for another job at that point, and uh, and I was able to to get a job down at Herbert Field, down at Seven Twentieth. Nice. And that was my first Air Force base. So about fifteen years into my career, I got to see my first Air Force duty station. All right. And, you know, I know it's so odd for Tech P's uh, people. I don't know if people know this, but like a Tech P normally is at an Army post with an Army unit. Um, there's a few, a select few. I think there's more now. There's starting to be more and more Air Force uh, assignments. But yeah, for the most part, we spend the majority of our, of our time at, at Army Post. But so the 720s, were you working the fire shop at the group or what were you yeah, doing? Yeah, I was, there, a, I was like the chief I at the fire shop. And then I moved around, um, went to future ops and current ops, and then ultimately moved over to the 2 force out and stood up the wing when the wing stood up. And I had yeah. like the JTAC position at the wing. Um, and then. From there, it's when I got into like I had to manage contract cast. So I had I was one of the one of the not the first. The first was like JC created it, then Matt Green managed it a little bit, and then I replaced him. Um, is in managing contract close air support. Mm -hmm. So so I did that. That was kind of like the main job. And then yeah, yeah. from there, you know, I I decided to pull the trigger, and I was I was totally planning on taking the CSRB, staying to twenty five. And, you know, and yeah, yeah, but frankly, I didn't like the way the Air Force was trending. <laughs> um, and you know, to be to be blunt, like I did, our mission is to fight our enemies, foreign and domestic, right? And right. and what I saw was us being more of a social experiment. Like some of this, the the society norms were filtration into the military. Yeah, and I was not such a fan of that. And yeah, so it was time to go at that point. Yeah, we talk about that quite a bit at work. It's just uh, the people forget what, like you said, people forget why we have a military. I mean, it's not to, um, it's not a place for everybody. It's not a place to so everybody can feel good about themselves. All for the most part, you know, it's a place where you are you you follow the orders of the officers above you in order to meet with and destroy the enemy. You know, I mean, that's essentially what the military is, and I I think. While we're doing, like you said, while we're doing all these other things besides training for combat, our adversaries are, that's only what they're doing. You know, they're only training for combat. So it's not only are we maybe getting a little weaker, but it seems like they are, they're getting stronger, you know, now. so it's, it's, I can see your point, man. It's very, it's kind of disconcerting that that we're in that regard. So it was, it worked out for me. And I was at, I was at my 20 year point. I was like, I think I retired actually like 20 years and seven months. And, nice. and, you know, there, there was more to the factor that it wasn't just that it was also that, you know, I was facing, you know, as you move up in, in Aslock, there's only so many senior spots that you can be at. Right. And they had just filled the senior spot and I was facing having to go back to, you know, I think my options were bliss, hood or drum. And I was like, mm. or <laughs> yeah. I can just retire and go do something else. Yeah. You get and your so retirement. I you can get a, get a yep. good, you know, yeah. What'd you, what'd you yeah, end up first doing? This? The first job? Well, when I retired, I, uh, I took a year, I actually became a, uh, I went and got my Coast Guard license and became a uh, captain on a boat. So, so I got a 50-ton no master captain. Yeah, so I'm a 50-ton master captain. And, and I was really? working as a captain on a boat, yeah. And on the side, I was doing, um, so that was like my main job. And then on the side, I was doing, uh, I started a business and I was doing like construction work for Pep Boys. Okay. So, 
um, my father-in-law was, he runs like, he's a facility manager for Carl Icahn and they run like pet boys and, uh, auto plus and these different things. And, and I would just, Hey, go, go put a water fountain in here. Hey, put a sink in here. So I, uh, I thought it'd be cool to learn those different trades and, you sure. know, it paid okay. So, so I did those two jobs. But, you know, what'd you do as a boat captain? Like what did you, did people, did you charter the, like, did you have a boat charter or like, what'd you guys do? Yeah. So I worked on a, on a 70 foot Italian yacht and <laughs> really? we would do, yeah, we would do charters for uh, mostly the owners. So yeah. there was like, there was like six or seven owners and they would come in and just charter once in a while. And then a lot of it's just boat maintenance and, you know, taking out. Oh, so you, just, owners you mean like seven go. guys owned one yacht? Right. Yeah. Okay. Cause okay. I'm not sure if when, yachting is expensive. I was like, going to say, it's a, yeah, different, yeah. it's a different level of cost. And, and it's like owning an airplane in the aspect yeah. of, I mean, every oh, time we filled up, it was like it was like eight thousand dollars to fill up, and and this was only a seventy foot boat. You know, this isn't one of the big, you know, hundred plus boats. But you know, we would go to Key West, and and it was five hundred dollars a night to dock, and to just sit down there a week. And it's just the cost is of of yachting is next a level lot. money, yeah, next, next level money. And then when you got a maintenance, I mean, I remember, I remember we spent like one hundred twenty thousand dollars fixing the engines one time, and it was just. And it wasn't even like an overhaul. It was just work doing to, to fix the engines. Just like basic maintenance stuff. Well, it, yeah, there was, you know, everything's more expensive. Yeah. And everything, you know, these were running MTU motors, so they're out of Germany. So all the parts had to come from Germany. Nothing's ever on standby. And, yeah. you know, for a while, the boat was in Fort Lauderdale. And Fort Lauderdale's, you know, it's kind of rich man's playground there. Yeah. And, but that was cool. I mean, I got to, I got to do some cool little trips on that. Yeah. So wait a minute. So backing up. Speaking of boats, weren't weren't you on that trip with Maddie and Kevin and uh, oh, yeah. his brother? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I, I want to get everybody on. I want to hear. I want that story out. But I don't know who to tell it. I mean, I know it's I nobody would tell it better than Kevin because <laughs> Kevin is the best storyteller there is. Oh yeah, yeah. But did you see his episode? I, no, I haven't seen it yet. I should great. check it out. It's good. It's good. Um, uh, there, he's all right so i'm sure he did he tell you that story no i i just remember it from you guys i was there you know i was i i wasn't there but you know what i mean like you guys got back right. and it's like told me all about so, it so the gist of that story is maddie you know maddie he like wants to live off the grid yeah, right. and he loves that stuff so he bought himself a sailboat he's like i'm gonna Maddie, you don't you don't know how to sail. He's like, I got sailing for dummies. So he bought sailing for dummies, <laughs> got a sailboat, and then invited his brother down, and then Kevin and me and yeah. our wives took us to Panama City. It was actually like it's past Panama City, like Mexico Beach, Port St. Joe is where it was at uh-huh. Port St. Joe. And drop us off at the marina. And they're like, You guys are idiots, but we love you, so <laughs> here you go. And we sail it takes us like three days to sail the boat back to Fort walton beach wait i thought you were down i thought it was southern florida but you were only over in panama city yeah, yeah we were in panama city but it was still adventurous <laughs> let me tell you that makes it even better <laughs> yeah it took us three days to get there's two and a half days for sure so we come out go out to pass the panama city and they get in the intercoastal and sail back to intercoastal and i mean just some random adventures that we had we ran the boat aground twice <laughs> Um, hey, at that time, just real quick, how many had any sailing experience none, for you? Yeah, none, not one. None, none, <laughs> not one bit. We were still in the military. This was like a weekend trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, they, they had the they had the sailing for dummies guide, and then you had Kevin with an. He was at least smart enough to bring an iPad with some charts on it, yeah. and then. Um, but you know, after being a captain, I learned a lot. There's rules of the road, you know. Yeah. There's so many things that you like. That what you didn't follow. Buoys are, oh yeah. Oh, not at all. Like <laughs> the different buoys, the channels, the what the different flags are, and the lights, and you know what you're supposed to do when you're mooring. We didn't do any of it. Um, <laughs> so, what was the idea? Like just to follow the, the coastline? It'd be like, all right, Panama City no, is up so there. So we, we didn't want to go this just way the until... we, we came out. We, we, were, we were in the ocean for a little bit, but then we got back in the intercoastal. And you can take the intercoastal from Panama City all the way to Destin, to the yeah, yeah. 
and uh, it's a nice little trip, but it, it's it gets sporty in some areas, and um, but it was plus. I think it, it. Do you think? Let me ask you this: Do you think it would have been easier had uh, anybody been sober at all during the whole trip? Or <laughs> well, we ran out of. <laughs> So we ran out of uh, alcohol by the end of the day, like day one and a half. And Maddie's brother had brought like, he had three gallons of wine. I had brought four handles. Um, we had beer. And it was all gone by by the end of day two. Um, oh, and the, and the toilet story. broke. The toilet broke on the boat too. So we had to oh. use over the, <laughs> we had to use facilities outside the boat. You know, um, oh, and then when we, got, when we finally got into the harbor, we pulled it in Destin Harbor and we we're spending the night because it was too late to finish the trip into Fort Walton. Yeah. And we're sitting there and we could smell McGuire's. We're like, oh my God, we're going to go get McGuire's. We have, think about it. We're like three days in the sun, not showered. And we were trying to get off that boat and go to McGuire's. And we almost crashed into the pirate boat there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard and that. Yeah. It <laughs> ultimately, we gave up, but you could. And just after we almost hit the pirate boat, that was we're like, all right, we should probably just be done. So, <laughs> moored for the night. But, but that was one of those trips. It's like, it was fun. I'd love to, I would love to get you all together and just hear about just everybody's account of that thing. Cause it, oh, yeah. Cause I'm sure I forgot about more things. And yeah, you guys telling that when you guys got back, I, it was just, I couldn't stop laughing. It was so amazing. So funny. Yeah. Anytime you do something with those guys, like, when we went, uh, we went fishing and we caught a shark. Uh, I remember that. Remember I saw the story? pictures of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you learned that the people's elbow doesn't work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my wife literally had a panic attack on the phone. So we're fishing. Quick story. So we're fishing. We're out with like Joe Monet, Kevin. There's another dude. I don't remember who it was. And me and Maddie, I think. And um, I had we've been catching these little fish all day, and I caught like a little teeny vermilion snapper or something. And I was like, "Oh, I'm just going to use that as a free floating bait line." So I cast it out the back while we're bottom fishing. And I just happened to look back like an hour later, and the, the my line was at the back of the boat. And I was <laughs> like, "Hmm." So I reel it in. Turn out I had a nurse shark on. It was like an eight and a half foot nurse shark. It was like 300 pounds. Yeah, and so we fight him. We're like, "Hey, let's let's keep it." And I wish we would have just let it go, but yeah. but we had a they have a shark gaff and a fish gaff, and they're like, "All right, ready, go!" And so they're videoing this too, and they they hook him with a shark gaff and the fish gaff, and it and it breaks the shark gaff or it breaks the fish gaff immediately and bends the shark gaff, and we get the fish up. I'm reaching over, I grab the tail, we get him up in the boat. And then he tries to like the fish tries to like bite Monet, so they drop it in the boat, and it's just flopping around in the boat like breaking fishing poles. And um, I called you. And at that moment, so my initial reaction was like, "If this thing's flopping around, they're wearing flip flops. I'm gonna re I'm gonna restrain it." So I just jump down on it, and I'm, I'm holding it down, and I try to give it the people's elbow to to maintain it. You know, I'm like, yeah. but that didn't work because. Apparently that doesn't work. So we right. have to rock about that. And uh, but right at that time, my wife calls and she's like, yeah. Kevin answers the phone and he's like, Hey, she's like, Hey, where's Richie at? Uh, he's a little preoccupied right now. She's like, Kevin, you guys are fishing on a boat. How preoccupied can he be? Yeah. And then she video chats me and she sees me sitting on this shark or like <laughs> holding a shark down and she's like loses it. Freaks out about, I don't know. You can you can orphan us and or just all kinds of things. Oh but, <laughs> yeah, she freaks out. Get but <laughs> um, anyways, but but that's the kind of stories you get into when you hang out with those guys. Oh yeah. Now yeah. there might have been a handle of Sailor Jerry's involved in that one also. <laughs> but um, that's what I used to love about. I don't know. Like everybody says, work hard, play hard, whatever. But I mean, it really got to that point where. You know, you you kind of blew off steam as hard as you worked. You know what I mean? It was like it was yeah. just and and like kind of stuff like that. Like you try to find stuff that was not run of the mill, not just your normal, you know, things that you you would blow off steam. But yeah, 
Give me a oh, second man. to adjust this. My battery's like five percent. Okay. Hey, well, no, we can wrap it up. I mean, that uh, we're kind of towards the end here anyway. Um, yeah, man. I, I, thanks a lot for coming on here. I appreciate it. I know it was kind of we had. Um, I know you're out of town, so I, I can't thank you enough for making the time to, you know, to come on here and tell your stories because they're they're awesome. They're amazing, and uh, and I, it's good to catch up with you too. Like I, that's the best thing about doing this is I get to talk to all you guys and like you know touch base with you after however many decades you know almost from from last time we talked. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right. All right, man. All right. Lindsay, good talking to you. You too. <laughs> good to All good right. to see you. You too. All right. All right, Richie, man. I'll see you later, okay? All right. Later, bro.